Merci beaucoup tout le monde de venir à cette conférence une heure inhabituelle et un jour inhabituel pour accueillir les citoyens de l'Université de Maastricht. Donc, les citoyens travaillent depuis plus ans des détecteurs Ligo et Virgo, la pression de doctorat au Max Planck Institute pour le musée gravitationnel à Hanover, en Allemagne, qui a fini en 2013. Ensuite, elle est allée postdoc à Glasgow, en 2016. Elle est revenue en Allemagne et en Hambourg, aussi comme postdoc jusqu'en 2019. Et depuis ce temps-là, elle est le poste de Maastricht. Euh, où est-ce qu'elle s'occupe de toutes sortes de choses, donc, entre autres, euh, les, les couches, les miroirs de l'ego, donc, c'est comme ça qu'on se connaît, euh, ça a été ma, ma co, on était ensemble des co, euh, euh, chair de, du groupe des Coutines de l'ego pendant euh, oui, l'année 2. Donc, euh, we can get her as co-chair of the coding group. Something like one and a half years or so. Yeah, that's how I know her very well, and we are interested in the same uh, uh, ways to improve uh, the, the mirrors. Uh, so she will be talking about that very interesting uh, gravitational waves of that. <laughs> and here was uh, this guy. Yeah, so thanks for the introduction. I hope because I don't speak any French, so I have no idea what he just told you, but um, I trust him. <laughs> Good. Yeah, so um, I will tell you a little bit about um, what I do, which is more or less material characterization, but with a very fancy application, which is um, looking at our universe. And um, my mouse doesn't react. Okay, that works. Um, yeah, so my talk will be split into more or less three parts. So I will give a general introduction about um, gravitational waves and how we are detecting them and why mirrors are important. Then I will tell you about the ET Pathfinder prototype for a gravitational wave detector, which we have in Maastricht. And I will conclude with um, mostly cryogenic, but also general uh, mirrors for our detectors. So gravitational waves, what is all of this about? Um, gravitational waves have been um, predicted by Einstein more than 100 years ago. And they are generated by everything in the universe, which kind of makes a loud bang. So if there's a supernova, um, if there are black holes merging, if neutron stars collide, all of that causes um, the release of a lot of energy in the form of gravitational waves. And those then travel through the universe at the speed of light. And the great thing about them is, one I already mentioned, uh, they are um, generated by dark objects, such as black holes, which we otherwise cannot see but also that they travel right through all kinds of matter. So signals which um, we couldn't see electromagnetically because stars, dust clouds, or anything is in the path between them reaching us, um, we can see with gravitational waves. So what does a gravitational wave do? Um, if it arrives here from space, it would increase the distance between me and you by a tiny little amount in that direction and shrink it a little bit in that direction. And this then happens periodically in turns while the gravitational wave travels through Earth. And actually, it's so big that this effect would be visible anywhere on the planet. But the issue is now it comes from very, very far away so that when these waves arrive here, they are really very, very tiny. So the length changes we expect to see correspond to at the very maximum. So a very, for a very strong gravitational wave to changing the distance between Earth and Sun by less than the diameter of an atom. 
And if we now look at a length chain like that here, or between me and you, that is so, so, so tiny that it's really, really tricky to measure. And this is why it took, um, yeah, more than 60 years from starting to develop the first detectors until actually getting sensitive enough to seeing gravitational waves. But this was now already te almost 10 years ago. And since then, we have seen quite many of them. The measurement principle is rather simple. So it's based on a Michelson interferometer. So the Michelson interferometer is actually the perfect instrument for seeing the length changes um, we want to see. So we have a laser source. It hits some beam splitter. A part of the beam transmits that way, gets reflected at the end. Another part gets re um, reflected this way, gets um, reflected at the end of the arm. They come back, overlap and we see some interference uh, or interfering signal at the photodiode. And when now the gravitational wave comes and does something like that, we see a um, changing interference relation on the photodiode. And it's, yeah, in principle, quite simple, but we can, of course, not measure anything with a small instrument. We build them with arms of several kilometers length. We suspend our mirrors to decouple them from seismic vibrations on Earth. We use fancy things like squeezed light, which is more or less altering the quantum nature of light. And um, we use additional mirrors in our detector arms. So here that's the so-called end test masses, ETM. So that is the mirror at the end of each arm. And here's the additional um, ITM, the input test mass, is an additional mirror which forms a cavity with the end mirror so that the beam bounces back and forth a few hundred times, which effectively makes our detector arms a few hundred times longer. And with this, we actually can see gravitational waves. We have currently five active detectors in the world. There are the two LIGO detectors, which are in the US. There's a Virgo detector in Italy. Then GEO is not quite sensitive enough to see gravitational waves. It also will never be because the name here, GEO 600, says it has 600 meter long arms, which is just too small to, to measure anything, but it serves as a test bed for new technologies. And then there's Kagra in Japan, which is built underground in a mine to um, decouple it more from seismic vibrations. And Kagra is not yet as, as its design uh, sensitivity, so it will be able to see gravitational waves. It's just not yeah, completely finished yet. So with these, we um, see gravitational waves. What it looks like in reality, here's a photo of the Virgo detector in Italy. So you see that actually it doesn't need much space as such. So you have some building here, which hosts all the beam preparation and some controls and so on. But otherwise, it more or less consists, in this case here, of three kilometer long vacuum pipes between fields. I mean, still, you have to find um, empty space in a straight line, but it's not actually, um, I don't know, requiring much area. With these detectors, we saw by now many, many gravitational wave signals. And by the, with those, saw many black holes may, mainly. So what you can see here is um, the light yellow and the pink dots here are black holes and neutron stars, which we know from electromagnetic sources. The orange points are neutron stars we saw with gravitational waves. But the blue dots, which are the vast majority here of black hole signals, are all black holes we saw with gravitational waves. The interesting thing is we cannot see a black hole which is just sitting somewhere in space, but we only see them when they are somehow accelerated, which mainly means we can see if two black holes uh, rotate around each other and finally merge into one bigger black hole. So what you see here are always sets of three of these um, blue dots of which two are smaller and they merged into one of the bigger uh, dots here. And if you um, would carefully look, which is not quite visible on the scale here, but usually you can see 
when looking at the scale of solar masses, that uh, usually when two of these smaller uh, dots merge into a bigger one, a few solar masses get lost. And that's actually the energy which gets sent out into space. And after a few million, billion, whatever years arrives here as a tiny little gravitational wave signal. So getting a little bit more technical. This is a typical sensitivity plot of a gravitational wave detector. Um, on the y-axis, you see the strain. So, so to say, the amount of, of, of length change you get from your gravitational wave. And on the x-axis, you see the frequency at which our gravitational wave occurs. And this frequency mainly de uh, depends on what kind of object do we have and what mass does it have. And now in our detector, we have all kinds of different things which keep us from actually seeing what we want to see. And that's uh, shown by all the colorful lines here. So at low frequencies, our main problem is that we are here on Earth and it's never quiet. So we have seismic, we have gravity gradients and all kinds of things which shake our detector. Um, very interesting is a purple line, which makes this kind of U type shape here, that is quantum noise. And quantum noise is composed of two different light related uh, noise sources. And that's at low um, frequencies, it's radiation pressure. So this means we have so much laser power in our detector that the photons actually um, um, yeah, exert some force onto our suspended mirror, even though that's something like uh, 40, 50 kilograms heavy, and they shake the mirror. So usually they wouldn't shake it, but there is this problem with light. There are some statistical fluctuations of the number of photons, and that's what causes the shaking. So it causes some noise. At high frequencies, we have a similar effect. There, we also have some counting statistics, so some fluctuations in the number of photons. But here the problem is that when we read it out on our detector, we see some noise on the signal. And now the most interesting point here is at lower frequencies, the lower our laser power is, the less um, force from the photons we have and the less our mirror shakes. But if we go to high frequencies, um, the more laser power we have, the smaller the relative noise is and the less noisy our signal gets. So ideally, to make our detector more sensitive, we want lower and higher power at the same time. So you see there is a bit of a problem. And then we have yeah, the most uh, interesting, from my perspective, um, noise source, which is coating thermal noise. Coating thermal noise is related to um, the energy inside our suspended mirrors which makes all the atoms and, vi uh, and, and, and molecules in the mirrors vibrate. This translates into a vibration of the mirror surfaces. So if we have our mirrors suspended and the surfaces vibrate, that is kind of hiding the distance changes we want to see from the gravitational waves. And all of these noise sources now add up to this dark gray line here that is hidden here behind the purple at high frequencies and behind the purple and then blue over here, but it's kind of the sum of all of this. And um, below that gray line, we have only noise and cannot see anything. And above the gray line, we are happy and can see gravitational waves. So with this kind of detector, we can currently measure when the detectors are running about one gravitational wave a week, which is great, but scientists are never happy and always want to see more, so we want more sensitive detectors. What we actually want is the following. So here's a blue line is vaguely the same as a, the gray line we looked at on the previous plot. So that is the sensitivity of the LIGO detectors once um, they have reached the best sensitivity. But we want to get here to the red line. And um, this is the design sensitivity of the Einstein telescope. That's a future planned European detector. And with this, we want to get about a factor of 10 more sensitive here at higher frequencies and a factor of 100 to 1,000 more sensitive at low frequencies. And the way we can get there is um, yeah, with inventing new things, with so-called 
disruptive technologies. So we have to be a bit more creative and inventive than just making everything in the detector a little bit better and a little bit better and a little bit better, but we have to significantly change. And one significant change um, will be that actually we, we split our one detector into two partial detectors, one at high frequencies with very high laser power to reduce the short noise. And this can stay at room temperature because at high frequencies, room temperature is okay. Temperature fluctuations are usually slow. So we care more about them at low frequencies. And at low frequencies, so this is where you see this dip here. So actually the high frequency detector would go up in sensitivity here. And the low frequency detector starts kind of there. And this area here is um, where they meet. And here at the low frequencies, we make our detector cryogenic to reduce coding thermal noise. We um, build it underground to reduce um, seismic and gravity related uh, noise sources. And we, um, no, I forgot what I already said. Ah, and we use very low laser power because um, then we can use, uh, or we, we, we can reach lower radiation pressure noise. So this is the kind of plan. And with this, we can get from the one signal we currently see per week in, on average to seeing much larger signals. So from weaker and further away sources um, all the time. So actually we will move from not seeing signals often enough to the problem, um, a, quite nice, a quite nice problem to have, but to the problem of seeing um, overlapping signals constantly and not thinking, oh, there's a nice signal, what could it be? Let's fit a few models of merging black holes to it to see what we actually saw. But we see some entangled weird mass of signals which we somehow have to um, um, yeah, disentangle into separate signals. But as I say, a nice problem to have, so still something we want to reach. And um, so the plan to get there for the Einstein telescope is making it 10 kilometers long, um, actually having three detectors in a kind of triangular configuration. So basically having, when thinking back to that Michelson interferometer, one beam splitter sitting at every corner of a triangle. We move the whole thing underground. We make actually two detectors at every corner of which one is room temperature, high power and so on, and the other is cryogenic low power. And um, that then solves hopefully most of our problems. There are currently two candidate uh, locations for this detector. One is a nice Italian island, Sardinia. The other one is a bit more central in Europe that's um, near the place where I come from. So the three border region or between Netherlands, Belgium and Germany, quite near to Maastricht. So um, this leads us now to the next part of the talk, which is uh, on the ET Pathfinder prototype. So short for Einstein Telescope prototype. And um, this is a um, yeah kind of downscale model of the Einstein Telescope we are currently um, building up in Maastricht to test these uh, so-called disruptive technologies. Um, ET Pathfinder will have rather large uh, vacuum tanks, so they are in size actually very close to what we will have in the end in ET. So what we see here in this model is Here's one vacuum tank which can host the uh, laser and beam preparation and so on. This is the beam splitter tower. And then here's one arm, there's the other arm, and each with one tower for the input mirror and one for the end mirror of the arm cavities. And what is basically missing compared to the real ET is that we shrink our 10 kilometer long arms to 10 meters of arms. So basically, instead of 10 kilometer vacuum, so 10 kilometer nothing, we have 10 meter nothing, so not much difference, only that with the shorter arms, we won't be able to see gravitational waves, but we will be able to test everything else we need to actually, hopefully, in the end, build the final ET. Um, now I would like to show you um, 
a small video. So I got a lot of lab tours here yesterday and today. So you get um, a tiny little snippet of a lab tour um, of our ET Pathfinder lab. So let's quickly share this here instead. And I can tell you a bit about the way how we got there. So this is starting to run, yes. So um, we are a very new physics department. So the whole physics at Maastricht University only started existing in 2019, so a little bit less than five years ago. And when we moved into our building, um, what now is the ET Pathfinder lab was actually a storage room for um, furniture. So there were abandoned desks and cupboards and that kind of stuff in there. And um, we started from scratch to remove the floor in this building, because if you want um, to build a sensitive device such as ET Pathfinder, um, you don't want the floor coupled to the walls because the wind shakes at the walls. You don't want this shaking to translate um, via the floor into the detector and so on. So the complete floor was um, built new and um, Actually, most of this work here, so the video you see here, um, that's about three minutes long, and that um, includes the time between January 2020 and January 2022. Um, so actually, um, if lockdown had to happen at some point, for us, it was the best possible point in time because um, we didn't have labs at all, and the companies just went ahead building our clean room while we were sitting at home writing emails and having Zoom meetings. So um, yeah, they kept building here the floor. Um, now the walls are uh, arriving. Um, in a little moment, you see that some kind of triangular part of the uh, room will, will kind of be built. And this is a clean room preparation area. So if we have to bring large things into this uh, clean room, like vacuum tanks, they have to be cleaned before coming in. They come in through a big gate into, the, um, into this hall and up in this triangular area where they get cleaned and then depending on the size, come through double doors into the room or they get lifted through the ceiling. Yeah, so here's this triangular area um, arriving. Um, now we are getting walls. Here's also the so-called visitor gallery arriving here in the left upper corner. So that's a room from which you can look into this hall because, of course, into a clean room, you don't want to bring visitors all the time who bring in dust and, and all kinds of things you don't want in a clean room. So this was actually um, what, what, one of the better ideas because it's uh, constantly occupied with, with people. So here you see some optical tables. So these longer ones are something like two by four meters. So just to have a bit of a measure how big uh, this room is. And um, yeah, here is now the first vacuum tank arriving. And um, now it's gone again, but I think it will come back in a moment. Think where the light was switched off that were Christmas holidays. Yeah, so here's now our first tank. So about six meter high. And um, you will also see in a moment that there is some kind of tent moving around in the building. So that tent we always put over places where we have to drill into the um, floor because um, we don't want to cause any dust. But there are still quite a bit of construction works ongoing. Yeah, so here's a tent again uh, floating around. And um, I think now we are yeah, clo close to finishing. So not much more interesting stuff is happening now. We can go back to the talk. Um, so this is what it looked like about two years ago, but um, we will see here in a moment um, where we are right now. Just hiding this again. Okay. So um, yeah, by now uh, the vacuum tanks and the um, vacuum pipes connecting the tanks all have arrived. All, what also has arrived are here all these pipes, which are actually for um, cooling the whole system to, um, in the optimistic case, somewhere around 15 Kelvin. So these are for liquid nitrogen, and um, the remaining cooling will then be done um, without cooling liquids, but via um, some cryocoolers. Yeah, here from a different perspective, so that's kind of the view. So the bending here is, of course, only from taking um, um, the picture at a wide angle. It's a straight line. 
but yeah, so that's kind of what, what our big lab in Maastricht looks like currently. And um, this whole project is, of course, not a Maastricht only project, but actually most of the institutions um, in the area. So most universities in the Netherlands, in Belgium, those nearby in Germany, they are all contributing to ET Pathfinder. They provide person power to help building it up and running it. And they um, also want to test one of the other technologies. Some are building our lasers, others are um, helping um, with the mirrors. Um, in Amsterdam, they are building the suspension system. So it's really a big team effort. Good. And this as the background. So in this system, we want to test technologies such as cryogenic detector operation, cryogenic mirrors and coatings and so on, which we um, need for the Einstein telescope. But um, I also have to admit the mirrors and the coatings we want to test in there don't exist yet. So there's still a little bit of work um, ahead. Um, so back to what mirrors are we talking about? So it's these four mirrors here. So the mirrors which are um, creating the cavities in our detector arms. And in particular here, the end mirrors have to be quite highly reflective. The target reflectivity is 99.9994%, um, quite high, also by far not impossible to create. What makes it tricky is that um, we don't only need the high reflectivity, but we need lots of other properties. I'll get back to that in a moment, but I just want to say a few more words about how these coatings look like. So this is here a schematic of um, the current ETM mirrors in our detectors, which are sensitive enough to detect gravitational waves. They consist of silica and of tantala, so two different materials um, with different refractive index. And the refractive index contrast it was, is what causes the high reflectivity. So at every layer interface, or actually at every layer interface from the low into the high refractive index material, you get a bit of reflectivity. And if you look here into the schematic, the blue line is uh, the light field. And you see that from ev for every layer pair, it, re oops, it reduces by about a factor of two. So here we start with nearly 100% of laser intensity. Here we have 50, 25, 12.5, 6, 3, 1. So here we are at less than 1% of the initial laser light, but we still need so many layer pairs underneath to get to the very high reflectivity, which we actually want. The whole coding needs to have an optical absorption of less than one part per million, because otherwise the mirror heats up um, in the case of a cryogenic detector, it would be a no-go for keeping the mirror at low temperature. In case of detectors at room temperature, we get problems with thermal distortions of the mirrors, with thermal lensing when the beam goes through the mirror. So it causes all kinds of trouble, and we want the absorption to be as low as possible. But we have many other requirements. So we need a low number of defects. We need very low optical scattering. We need a very homogeneous layer thickness. So our current coatings have a total thickness of something like six microns, but the thickness of this whole six micron um, thick uh, multi-layer is across a diameter of 20 centimeters, better than three nanometers of variation. And our future mirrors for the Einstein telescope are supposed to have a diameter of about half a meter. Other detectors, such as Cosmic Explorer, which is planned in the US, has longer arms and therefore, just from the light propagation perspective, needs bigger mirrors, which are probably then something like 60, 70, 80 centimeters in diameter. So we need very good coatings. We need them large and we have lots of different, um, um, yeah, requirements here, which I try to group a little bit. So some are more production technology related, so that's something we can improve. Others are intrinsic material properties, which we only can um, yeah, improve as far as the material lets us do this. If the material doesn't get good enough, all we can do is find better a different material. 
So back to our red line here um, of uh, coding Brownian noise. Um, what is this composed of? I already said a few things. So the coding thermal noise is proportional to the temperature or actually um, to the square root of the temperature. So if we want to um, reduce our coding thermal noise by a factor of um, five or so, we would need to go from 300 Kelvin from room temperature, a factor of 25 lower in um, in temperature, so somewhere near uh, 20 Kelvin or so. So this is kind of our target. Um, our coding thermal noise is proportional to the beam diameter because if we have a larger beam, we, we average over more of the vibrations on the mirror surface. So we want the beam to be as large as possible, but of course producing a larger mirror is not uh, always easier, so it's a bit of a trade-off. We want a thin coding, but the problem about a thin coding is, I mean, we have re um, requirements on the reflectivity. So we depend again on the refractive index. So what we actually want is a high contrast between the refractive indices of our two materials. Mm -hmm. And then we have here the most interesting uh, property, which um, yeah causes us uh, the biggest headache in, in our collaboration, which is the mechanical loss. So materials with a low mechanical loss is what we need. And that's not only the mechanical loss of the coding, but also the mechanical loss of the substrate. And just to go into a bit more detail of uh, what the mechanical loss is, I um, yeah brought here a picture uh, you are probably all familiar with. In case anyone has never seen a wine glass, I borrowed one this morning from uh, Foswa. So we have a nice glass. And um, when you ping the glass, so you get a some it's a bit quiet. So you get some sound. And the sound is related to the Q factor or the quality factor of the object. So at the resonance of the object, the Q factor is inversely proportional to the mechanical loss. So if you have a high Q factor of your object and you get a long, clear sound, so a long sound means a high Q factor, and that means we have a low mechanical loss. So um, the longer and clearer our sound, the better. And if you would take one of the mirrors in our gravitational wave detector and ping them, the sound would in principle go on for yeah, many, many minutes, maybe hours. And the mirror substrate itself are really very, very good. The problem are the coatings. So um, let me show you what happens if we coat this. So we give the, um, the glass some, some sugar coating, a little bit uh, like cocktail style here. So I made it um, a bit, uh, let's see if I can manage here, um, a little bit wet around the edge. So, just put that into the, or maybe just before I do that, again, a reminder what it sounds now. So quite nice. And now we put the coating onto our mirror here, actually very close to an amorphous coating, having here a little bit of sugar. And what happens is that, so the sound becomes much less clear, much shorter. So it means that the mechanical loss um, of the whole system decreased. Um, the material property, of course, stays the same, but it's a whole package. So we add something with a high mechanical loss to something with a low mechanical loss. And what you see is some kind of average of the properties of both. So what does it look like in our detector? Um, so before we have only looked here at the straight red line, which is just the coding on its own. But what we see in the detector is a thermal noise, um, which is a sum of here the suspension thermal noise uh, peak, then here the coding itself. So here uh, on, on, on the side actually. And then at low frequencies, you have another resonance peak. And this resonance peak here comes from the pendulum mode of the mirror suspension, 
while this resonance peak here comes from the internal, the drum mode of our mirror substrate. And what is now related or what happens with our mechanical loss changing is that if we have a high mechanical loss, so that's here the, the black line, we um, get less high. So you see here maybe hopefully a little bit that the black peaks are a little bit less high than the red peaks. So our peaks are a bit broader. Um, we have more energy dissipation um, around these peaks. So if I excite a resonance, what happens is that we um, yeah, distribute more energy into other frequencies, into other kind of vibrations, and we uh, lose more energy from our resonance um, per kind of um, oscillation cycle uh, at this resonance. While if we go lower in loss, what happens is, sorry, what happens is that um, our energy stays longer at this resonance. Our peak becomes higher, it becomes more narrow, and simply due to energy conservation, um, so the vibrations have to be lower at all the other frequencies. And in our detectors, we cannot see anything here at the resonances, so they disturb us anyway, and we don't care if they are a bit higher or a bit less high. But what we do by selecting the ideal material for our mirrors is basically um, redistributing the noise from here in the in the center where we don't want it, where we want to see our gravitational waves into the peaks where we don't care about it and um, kind of we shovel our noise away to where we yeah are fine with it. So looking at mechanical loss in a gravitational wave detector. Um, here you see mechanical loss of the silica and the tantala coating um, in our um, current multi-layer coatings. Um, quickly, before I get back to this, to the measurement. So how do we measure mechanical loss? We actually do what I've just done here with this glass. So we take a sample, we physically ping it. I mean, not as physical as it's shown here in the picture with a hammer, but um, we actually use an electrostatic pulse, but we ping it, we excite a resonance, and we measure the time, how long it takes for the um, resonance to decay. And we do this with a sample before it gets coded, and then we code it and do the same again. And then we can do some finite element modeling to see how the energy is distributed between the substrate and the coding, get some kind of factor and can afterwards um, disentangle how much uh, mechanical loss we had in our coding. Um, works quite well, looks in practice like this here. So here you see a thin glass disc. Here on top, you see the electrostatic drive. And what we do is we kind of balance this glass disc simply on a lens, so on something curved, so that we have as little interaction area here in the center as possible, so that if we ping it and it vibrates, um, there is as little friction and as little damping as possible at the suspension point. Actually, we even go a step further and we model before how our, just to go back to this one, how our um, resonances look like, so in this case here, we have lots of vibrations around the edges, but almost no vibrations in the center. So if we pick a resonance mode, where the disc does not vibrate in the, in the center, we have more or less no damping here at all. And that lets us measure the mechanical loss quite easily. So, um, so back to this plot here. What we do is then re um, excite many resonance frequencies of our um, coded disk, and for every resonance you see here one of these points and these bars around this show that there's a slight frequency of this material parameter mechanical loss uh, in itself. What we also see is that the mechanical loss of the silica is much lower, almost an order of magnitude lower than that of the tantala, and that you can do things like doping the tantala with a little bit of titania, and that brings down the um, mechanical loss by something like 25% or so. But um, even the small improvement is worthwhile for us because it's really not very easy to make the mechanical loss better. 
But the main message of this plot here is in current room temperature detectors, we are quite fine with the silica as low refractive index material, but the, the bad guy here is a tantala. So we need replacements for the tantala. Um, finding these replacements is a bit of a kind of trial, trial and error mixed with actual modeling of the materials. So I won't go into too much detail here. That's not my area of expertise. My my expert area of expertise is actually knowing a little bit of everything, but nothing very deeply. So um, that's how it is with us gravitational wave people usually. Um, but the main message here is that um, there are so materials which are so-called edge sharing or face sharing or corner sharing structure um, in the material. And you can, can find correlations between these uh, structural um, behavior and the mechanical loss. And one which was found was that um, Germania, for example, is very similar in terms of this behavior to silica and therefore should be a rather promising material in terms of mechanical loss and which therefore was a material where people followed up on um, how it behaves, so what the properties are. And um, yeah, actually Germania in itself has a too low refractive index so that people mixed titania into it to increase the refractive index. And this turned out to be rather good in terms of uh, mechanical loss and can improve our current detectors up to almost a factor of two, which um, is the next uh, goal for the current LIGO and Virgo detectors. So this is currently our prime candidate for our next um, mirrors or mirror coatings. While um, mixtures of silica and titania also are still being investigated, and silicon nitride is another material which is being investigated. So um, people, yeah, always look at several um, solutions in parallel because um, we are maybe we are just pessimistic, but we uh, always want to have an alternative in case something doesn't work out because uh, sometimes. Um, materials cannot be optimized as much as we want to because during heat treatment, which is required to reduce the mechanical loss and the optical absorption enough, um, but this heat treatment can also cause problems with stress between the two different types of materials if the properties are too different, then the coating cracks and so on and so on. So lots of uh, bad things can um, actually happen here. So. Um, here we can get a factor of up to two in improvement, but I don't think very many people believe that with amorphous coatings we can get much further at room temperature. So if we want more significant improvements, we um, yeah have to become a bit more creative. And um, one of these ways to get even more improvement are low temperatures. Um, a problem with low temperatures is if you look here at our mirror substrate, at the fused silica, that's the red dots, you see that at um, room temperature, we have nice low mechanical loss here, 10 to the minus eight. But if we cool to 20 Kelvin, we lose about five orders of magnitude. Earlier, I told you we get about a factor of five improvement when we cool from room temperature down to 10 or 20 Kelvin. So it seems not to be a very good deal if we win a factor of five, but we lose five orders of magnitude. So what we need are other materials. And our current prime candidate for a new mirror material is crystalline silicon. But um, at the wavelengths we currently use, so around one micron, it's about uh, as transparent as it is here in the visible, which um, means not, not at all. So we need new wavelengths and look at around one point five or two microns um, when we want to use this as a mirror material. On the coating side, it actually looks similar, unfortunately. When we um, start here at uh, room temperature, we take our current silica and tantala coatings, and we are optimistic and think, OK, all the properties stay the same, and we cool to low temperatures, we would get the blue line. But what happens in reality is we uh, get the red line here because the mechanical loss of the material changes when we cool it and gets actually higher and partly compensates for the cooling uh, we do and we are not as good as, as possible. 
or as, as optimistically uh, estimated initially. And um, this means we still need, even at low temperature, new and better coating materials. Um, okay, just said that. Um, but yeah, the new coating material or the, 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 the low temperatures and the new wavelengths open up also uh, new interesting ideas for coating materials. And again, for example, silicon nitride is an interesting candidate. Amorphous silicon is a very interesting candidate. Um, but amorphous silicon, um, so they both have a very low mechanical loss, even lower than silica at room temperature. Um, a high refractive index helps us to make the coating thinner. But in this case, we have an absorption problem. The interesting thing about silicon is you produce the same material five times and five times you get a totally different behavior. So we are fighting a very big parameter space with lots of unknowns in it. And um, we actually managed to improve from um, having absorptions, so extinction coefficients, so the complex refractive index in the 10 to the minus three uh, range. And we got from there into the low 10 to the minus five range but that's still about two orders of magnitude higher than what our current coatings have, which are in the 10 to the minus seven. So there's still a little bit of work to do, but um, we are trying to optimize the material, but we are also trying um, other ways uh, um, to improve our coatings. This here is a, what we call multi-materials. There are, of course, uh, many other names for this. So that's the picture I showed you earlier. And we said that about here, we are at 1% um, of the laser power. So why not take the coating up to here, where we are at 1% of the laser power, so two orders of magnitude lower in what can be absorbed, and put that on top of our 10 to the minus 5 um, silicon absorption. And suddenly we are at the 10 to the minus seven and comparable to our current coatings. So let's just take more than two materials, make such a coating, also get thinner with our coatings because, because um, the silicon has a higher refractive index and we need lower layers, uh, fewer layers. So um, this is in principle a quite promising concept. Um, should work absorption wise, should work with, um, um, should, should work uh, mechanical loss wise. It just unfortunately give us not as much improvement um, in terms of mechanical loss or coating thermal noise as we need to because the absorption is still a little bit too high and we cannot replace as many layers as we would like to. But again, a good start. A completely different approach is using crystalline coatings. If you compare here few silica, so that's the same plot we looked at uh, a few slides ago, um, and compare that to crystalline quartz, so kind of the crystalline counterpart of the same material, and suddenly we have a much more narrow and much less high um, low temperature loss speed. So crystalline materials have quite favorable property properties in many ways. Um, it's just, as always, not so easy. So to grow a crystalline multi-layer coding, you need a substrate with a matching lattice structure, you need two materials with a matching lattice structure. If we look at this plot here, we can pick some lattice structure, find two materials which are um, kind of almost in one line, that's a good starting point, but then we want to have a big difference in band gap, so to have a big difference in refractive index, because otherwise we will have to make a coding made of 100 layers or so, which, which we again don't want. And it's all not so easy, but people are working on it. Um, Algas coatings, so al aluminum gallium arsenide and gallium arsenide is a furthest developed material. The problem, we cannot grow it on silicon. We have to grow it on gallium arsenide wafers. These are a little bit smaller than the silicon mirrors we want to have in the end. Um, so we have a size problem. We also have the problem, we need to substrate transfer the coating. So what's usually being done is we take our wafer, grow our coating, bond it upside down to the substrate, etch off away the carrier wafer, and get this picture here. Works nicely in principle, works well at room temperature, 
But if you code such an ALDAS or transfer such an ALDAS coding to um, a silicon disk and go through a few cooling cycles, you see that the coding starts peeling off from the substrate and that's maybe also not quite what we want. Um, there has been a lot of improvement since this picture was taken, but it's another challenge uh, we are facing. Um, there are other materials being discussed. L -gas and, uh, L -gap and GAP is an option that can be grown directly on silicon, but it comes with an absorption problem. Um, people are looking into ferro-oxides. These can be grown on uh, sapphire. Um, sapphire is another possible uh, um, alternative compared to silicon, so that would be very interesting, but this research is still at a very early stage. But um, crystalline coatings are an interesting um, option. There are kind of hybrid solutions. Um, for example, you can use silicon insulator wafers to really just benefit from the thin uh, top crystalline silicon layer. You take this wafer, coat it with an amorphous multilayer, bond that whole thing upside down on your substrate, edge of the wafer, and you have one single crystalline silicon layer on top. One could wonder why is that useful? but it actually is quite useful because a single silicon layer due to the high refractive index can reflect almost 70% of the laser power, which means um, itself, it doesn't add to the absorption, it doesn't add to the thermal noise because it has such good properties, but it reduces the absorption underneath by 70%, which is actually quite beneficial. You can also, um, an idea here the Montreal guys have, um, actually build kind of a stack of these silicon and insulator wafers to make um, a more significant part of your coding um, that way. So you can combine all these different approaches into something which um, makes you, in the end, end up with some, some improved coding. And I'll get to an end in a second. So just one last um, um, project to mention we are working on uh, in Maastricht is um, actually creating a few layers of our coating via ion implantation right inside our crystalline mirror substrate to produce SiO2 or silicon nitride in the substrate to replace a few layers of our coating by that, which again um, replaces a few layers um, by something which a lower absorption and a kind of negligible um, mechanical loss. So it's just, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm throwing now a lot of different ideas at, at you, but it just reflects kind of the status of our work. So it's um, a mix of interesting concepts, which we are all trying to get into some um, more developed uh, state. And um, it's all making progress. And we are still looking for the best solution for our next generation detectors to get us where we want to be in terms of design reflectivity. And um, yeah, here just a few co uh, photos, what it looks like in our lab in Maastricht. So here's our absorption measurement setup. Here our cryostat for mechanical loss is just being assembled. And um, this is our ion implant, uh, um, which is actually located in California because Believe it or not, but it's cheaper to um, host it in a lab in California than transporting it to Maastricht and pay the rent for our labs. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, but also sounds nice. We have a second lab in California. I mean, um, good for uh, advertising school. Yeah, and the basic summary is really just um, with reaching design sensitivity of the Einstein telescope, we will see a lot more gravitational waves, but this really needs new technologies. These technologies we are planning to test in ET Pathfinder. If any of you ever visits Maastricht uh, or the Netherlands, you're very welcome to um, have a look. And um, a very big part of the tests in ET Pathfinder and the development steps towards the Einstein telescope are the mirror coatings. So, that's it from my side, and I'm happy to take any questions.